So, uh, well, uh, good afternoon. My name is Wolf Brunner. I am the director of the UC Shaw Foundation Center for Advanced uh, Genocide Research. And uh, uh, thank you for all for coming. And uh, it is my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce Geraldine von Feiter. I don't say the full name. No. <laughs> Geraldine von Feiter. Um, and uh, she is the current uh, center fellow um, of this academic year at the Center for Advanced Genocide Research. She got her PhD from the University of Amsterdam in 1999, and the topic was uh, the German criminal courts in the occupied Netherlands as an instrument of Nazi policy. She has been uh, awarded with several uh, prestigious uh, research fellowships, for example, at the International Institute for um, Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem, and that's, I think, when we met for the first time, was it during your fellowship? I think so, right? No, I think it's a grassroots. Oh, yeah, at the grassroots conference. The year before. The year before. Yeah. Okay, so even know each other here one year longer. And then she was also a research fellow at the Neot Institute for War and Holocaust and Genocide Studies in Amsterdam. Uh, she has uh, published in several lang languages so far, and her last book uh, is uh, called Hitler's Bruderford, um, which is kind of brother's Hitler. Translate um, <coughs> uh, was published by Rutledge in 2015, and the topic is uh, the uh, participation of Dutch uh, people uh, in the Far East, uh, in the occupied Soviet Union, um, kind of taking part in the Germanization of these uh, these territories. So um, she called it the uh, engagement of uh, Dutch pioneers in the Holocaust by bullets. And her current research is uh, uh, about the relationships between Jews and non-Jews in the Netherlands, and she really looks uh, at this uh, on a micro level. And we had previous research done uh, uh, by the first center fellow uh, in a comparative way uh, on the Ukraine, and now we can look more into these really close relationships uh, in the Netherlands uh, uh, following her research. And. Uh, she uses a special concept for doing, uh, investigating these uh, relationships, but we will probably talk about this. Yeah. The <laughs> so-called emotional communities, and I mention this only because she or, uh, also organized a, a workshop and a seminar at the Holocaust Museum on this topic. So, without further ado, welcome Geraldine von Feiter. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I will put my glasses on and off, and it's very, I know it's very uh, irritating maybe, but I can't, I, can't, I really cannot read it anymore. It's, <laughs> I, I have to blow it up a little bit more even, but then, I don't know. Anyway, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you, uh, Martha, Marika, and the team for uh, organizing this, because um, I'm very happy and excited to tell uh, you all about my uh, research. I've been walking around in uh, the building and at the campus with my flip-flops, I'm not going to put them out until I'm home. And um, maybe some of you have been wondering what I'm, I'm doing here. <laughs> so um, that, that I would like to tell you something about it. Um, it was the last days that I really started to think about it. And um, for anyone who, is wor who has worked with the testimonies um, w w will recognize that it's, it's very difficult. You just first you gather a lot and you collect a lot of material, and now you have to make sense of it. So I'm trying here. This is this is all tentative and this is all um, exploratory. But I, I, I would like you to, to, to bear with me and, and listen to um, the very preli preliminary um, conclusions that I would like to draw from my little research. Okay, I organized uh, the presentation as follows. I first would like to tell you something about uh, the Netherlands and Jews in the Netherlands, short, and then something about the historiography, the scholarship until now. So what, what do my colleagues and uh, what do I self, what do we know about uh, uh, the Holocaust in the Netherlands? And then uh, hopefully I will make clear that from this um, expose uh, a few questions rise or emerge, and, and, and these are the questions that I, I ask myself, and that, that, that's my own research. And then, finally, I will come to, to the testimonies, and so the question, what do testimonies bring extra or as additional uh, knowledge uh, for, for us, for me, and for scholars uh, on the Holocaust in the Netherlands? Okay, first, the Netherlands, just, I'm, I'm just, you know, just sometimes nice to 
think about home. This is the Netherlands. It's a very small country in Europe. Some people don't know where it is, so now everyone knows where it is. It's next to, it's next to Germany, next to uh, the North Sea, and uh, Belgium is below. That's, that's basically it. It's a, it's a country we all know because of this, I guess. <laughs> I mean, the tulips, the, the wooden shoes. I'm not going, I told Martha already, that I'm not going to talk <laughs> about the tulips and the history of wooden shoes, but this is, this is what we have in, in mind if we think about <laughs> Netherlands. Most of the people do, I think, still do. Um, but this is more like the Netherlands. It's, it's uh, surprisingly green. I will be surprised again when I fly back. It is green, and it is, if you look at the pictures, it's extremely ordered. You know, it's flat. We don't have hurricanes. We don't have bushfires. We, have, we even don't have flooding. We just have a very flat and neat country. It's all very well ordered and organized. And if landscape is a kind of... Um, um, expression of society, I don't know if you can say it, then, uh, then you could say that the Netherlands, the, 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 the Dutch society is also well organized, well ordered, there are laws, and it's, it's a very calm uh, country in a way. Okay, So that, that's, one, that's one stereotype of the Netherlands, it's calm, nothing much really happens, it's just well organized and well structured. Um, well, this is the other part of it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we also have this myth of tolerance. We have this myth of Dutch tolerance, which is really, really very strong. We like bikes. I mean, I think uh, if you like to cycle and you are here in LA and you're Dutch, it's a little bit of a shock. Because in the Netherlands, the bikes, bikes rule, cyclists rule. <laughs> this is a picture of, of Amsterdam, and that's basically really how it is. If you're on the bike, the most democratic um, transport means of transport I think you have the right to rule and and so so we have a lot of tolerance in the sense of we we, we accept we accept uh, bicycles we don't try to get them off the streets at all we have this permissive society since the 70s which means basically that we allow in the Netherlands we allow uh, uh, soft drugs to be sold and to be uh, uh, um, consumed not to be grown I think it's very strange but anyway we have that already in the Netherlands for quite some time. So it's a very tolerant society also in that aspect. And we have, and that's the point that I would like to get to, we have this long tradition, that's what we think, of being tolerant towards minorities. Okay, whether it's gays like this, this is the Canal Parade, it's every year, that's a big, big, big festival. And it's a festival that's celebrated by gays and non-gays. All my non-gay friends go there to celebrate, to have a party. It's just a huge thing. So we have this tradition, or we have this idea, this myth of tolerance, this myth of acceptance of minorities. And this is a myth that is quite often traced back to history. I mean, th that's what you do if you want the myth to be strong, then you, you go back into history. And it, th th this, uh, um, this tolerance towards minorities really is traced back to the 16th and 17th century when the Dutch people revolted against the absolute uh, uh, um, um, uh, king of, of Spain, the, the, the Spanish crown. It was the, the, it, the Dutch revolt is famous and we afterwards, we got a republic <coughs> as one of the first countries in, in, in not, a, not a king, not a monarchy or something else, an emperor, but a, a republic. For quite some time we had a republic. And in this republic, because we were fighting, I'm just talking about we because it makes it easier to, just to, to, to carry on, but um, it was not me, I'm not that old, but um, it, it's just that um, um, because we, 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 uh, we, we created, we, we fought this uh, uh, Catholic, the Catholic Church and this Catholic uh, uh, king of Spain, um, Freedom of religion was in the Netherlands already in the 16th and century an, ex an, 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 uh, uh, an important char characteristic of the, uh, um, the republic of the, of, the, of, of the Netherlands, basically. And this also meant that a lot of Jews in, in that from that period onwards felt at home or went to the Netherlands to find a safe haven. So, for instance, first the, the, uh, many Jews, Sephardic Jews from Spain and Portugal that were victim of uh, the Inquisition came to the Netherlands, and that's already in the 15, mostly in the 16th uh, century. Later on, um, Jews from Eastern Europe came to the Netherlands, and mostly to Amsterdam too. 
So there is this, it already started in, in, in the 16th, 17th century, and, and you know, that this, this myth of uh, uh, religious tolerance, but also of integration of Jews and non-Jews in the, in the Dutch society. Um, emancipation started early, <coughs> uh, civil rights for Jews in the Netherlands were already acquired in, I think, the end, I think 1792, but I could be a, a few years, but it was really the late uh, 18th century. And the 19th century brought really uh, 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 emancipation of, the, of, of Jews also in uh, political, in the, in the Dutch administrations, and so political sense, and also in economic sense, in, in, in Dutch uh, industry, in Dutch uh, you know, modern uh, economy, Jews were, were uh, finding a place. They were, in a way, they were, this is this, this idea, they were integrated in this Dutch society. They were members of the same community. I just mentioned that term for one time. Okay, so this is, this is the, 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 the myth of tolerance, or what I would call the myth of Dutch tolerance towards, now in this, this specific case, uh, towards uh, uh, Jews. <coughs> um, and in a way, if you, look at, uh, uh, if you look at the war years, this myth is in a way, it's, it's, it's supported by the, 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 um, the story of Anne Frank. I guess it's the iconic story of Dutch, uh, well, she was really a German, she was really from Germany, uh, a German, German refugee family in the Netherlands and hiding in the Netherlands. It's, it's a story about hiding. It's a story about hiding with her family, um, finding also love. It's also <laughs> about a girl growing up and finding love with this boy, which was not family. Um, hiding in, in a house that, or in, an, uh, yeah, in a building that belonged to the family, so trusted surrounding. Um, Problems in this family, everyone stayed together in this, this, this secret annex. Um, but it's also a story about trusted friends, helpers, that they knew already from the 30s, people that worked for Otto Frank, the father. And um, this, so this is a story, this is the most, I think, the most famous story maybe in the whole world about hiding or the persecution, but definitely in the Netherlands. This is a story how many people when they think about uh, uh, the persecution in the Netherlands, they think about this story. A story of a family staying together, having their problems in this very cramped, uh, in this cramped place, um, of a young girl falling in love also, um, staying together in a, in, a, in a place they knew, um, the annex of their own building, and being helped by Dutch friends, friends from the pre-war time. By the way, she in the middle, Mipris, was also not a Dutch. She was an Austrian, uh, but she was, uh, how do you call it, nationalized. Um, now, now I come to the problem. Because this is, so this is the story we have. So this is the, the myth we have, the myth of tolerance that's being bolstered by the story of Anne Frank, perhaps. And these are the facts. I'm not going to mention them all, but you can read them. We had. In the Netherlands, there were 140,000 Jews registered in 1940, um, 1941. Uh, in that sense, that Jews that, that, were, that would fall under German law uh, as, Jew, as full Juden, as, as, as full Jews, uh, Jews, and would be deported. And if you look in 1945, there's only 35,000. It's, it's all estimation, but 35,000 come back. Are, are, are are still alive. That's an incredible number. I mean, if you compare that to the number uh, of the percentages of for, for, for in France or uh, well, Belgium, and Denmark and Norway, forget these, but, but France and Luxembourg and Belgium, then this number of, of this percentage of almost 75% uh, people um, of the Jewish uh, population that perish, that's an enormous, that's, an, that's a very large number. And um, and even if you if you if you take it a little bit further and you look in 1950, then you see that this number even decreased uh, decreased further. Of these 35,000, um, let's say 20,000 left. So more than half left the Netherlands in these five years uh, between 1945 and 1950. 
so this is this is the this is disturbing. This I mean this is not, this is this is this is something that that you, that is difficult. I mean, on one hand, you have this myth of uh, this myth of tolerance, and this society was a perfect society. Jews were completely integrated, and on the other hand, you have this you have the, the facts, and, and, and the facts are really, uh, well, there, something must have happened in the Netherlands during the war that this could happen, basically. So this is called the Dutch paradox in, in literature. It's, it's, it's just something that <coughs> uh, I just wanted to mention. I'm, I'm not the first scholar who is, who is who's thinking about this, this, this strange, um, yeah, kind of also par well, paradox or maybe even contradiction. This is something that I cannot rhyme. There were, were many people, were many, many other scholars that have been thinking about this. But what you see in these studies mostly is that um, um, most of the uh, um, scholars, they are uh, interested or they, they, they focus, in particular the early works, they focus on, um, in, well, they are examples of institutional political history and they focus on the German policy. Okay, that's one thing. So the, the, the main actor in the stories of the most stories of, uh, of the Holocaust in the Netherlands are stories about German policy. Okay, there is some change happening the last year, so that's, th these books are uh, from more recent date and there's more interest, uh, interest in, in the, uh, the attitude of Dutch people. But in particular, in the attitude of Dutch or the activities of Dutch collaborators, so people that really collaborated in, in the uh, persecution of Jews. Um, but in general, we, we, we can really say most books are very general overviews. They focus on, on perpetrators and they uh, um, they have a little, little room for uh, Jews, uh, for Jewish agency. So Jews in these stories are often the passive party. To, ha to, to Jews, things happened. But you have hardly uh, stories where Jews, where this Jewish answer or this Jewish response to this persecution is put uh, at center, sp at center um, stage. The, the stories about Jews, Dutch Jews and, and, and um, in the Holocaust are quite often, you can find them in fiction, in literature, but not in the domain of, uh, of uh, history, of academic history. Um, so, this is what I, I, I wanted to, to, to stress, that, that that's, and, and this is also where my own research comes in. So much of the research is really in, in, that is existing now is about perpetrators or about uh, bystanders, and very little is about victims. What I would like to do in my research, that, that, that what I want to do and what I'm hopefully doing, is looking not so much at these different categories, so, so move beyond the three categories, but look at relations. Look at relations between, forget the labeling, just look at relations between people. Um, and, and forget maybe also a little bit the Germans, forget the perpetrators, but look more at the relations of what we would call bystanders, which is the largest group, and uh, victims, which is also a very, very large group. And look at individual relations. So that was one thing that I, I wanted to do, and, and that's what I'm, I'm doing now, is I, I, tr I try to move away from groups of people, so perpetrators, bystanders, uh, victims, but look at Re relations between people, <coughs> and um, then in particular, look try to get the voice or the the agency of Jews more into the picture of the the Holocaust in the Netherlands. Um, so this is these are just examples of interactions that I would like to look at. These are the things that, I, that I'm interested in. I'm interested how can this happen? How can this myth of, how can this integrated, this so-called integrated society, how can that fall apart? So I'm interested in these relations. So who is drinking their tea and taking a picture of their Jewish neighbors being taken away or being ready to be deported? Who are these people? Do they do something? And who are, there are also people hanging out of the windows. 
And this policeman, I don't know where it is, I forgot to, to look it up, but this policeman, what is he doing exactly? Does he know these people? Or do they know each other? Did they know each other before the war? Is something changed now? And this is, I find, a fascinating picture because I have no idea. This is a woman, and, and she, she, she's clearly uh, she's wearing a star, but is this her friend? Is she alone? Is she allowed to walk here? What is this woman doing there? So I'm interested in these, and these, this two girls in hiding. So where, how did they know? How did they know the farmers? Were they friends already? Did they go there on a holiday before the war? So I'm interested in how these, yeah, that's basically what, uh, what I'm, I'm interested in. I'm interested in these human relations on a very small scale and how they developed, uh, developed or evolved over time. Um, and, well, this was a much more complicated picture, but then I thought, well, forget all the theory. I'm just going to say two important, my two key notions that I'm using for my research, and that is community and identity. I want to look at how Jews saw themselves, how, how survivors, because th that's what I'm working with here, how, survi how survivors S uh, look back at how they saw themselves. This sounds very complicated, but, but were they aware of the Jewish, was Jewish identity an important identifier in their lives before the war? And how did it change during in the war? W what was their community? Who, who, who did they feel connected with or emotionally attached to? Are they emotional community? How do they so I'm interested in emotions and perceptions. And I'm, 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 I think that the testimonies for, for looking at perceptions and uh, emotions is in particular very uh, interesting. So um, my basic questions are, uh, so, so my, my key notions are community and identity. And I'm looking at being and belonging or emotions and perceptions. I want to look uh, through the eyes of, of individual Jews and Jewish survivors, because that's the only thing I have, we have, I think. And I just want to mention a few key questions that I have. For instance, how did Jews, these survivors, how did they see themselves, and who did they per perceive <coughs> as their peer peers or members of their community? And how did these perceptions and feelings change over time? So what was the effect of the Holocaust uh, on these uh, feelings and perceptions? And what is also interesting, did they find help um, did, did their, I mean, did their peers and their, the people that they thought were members of their pre-war community, did they, in fact, also help Jews? How did it work? And then I have larger questions because this has to do with method methodology. I have the question that I want to, uh, uh, no, I'm not the question. I have questions that are related to uh, um, using a kind of micro-historical approach. So I want to look at, so can this, uh, micro micro scale research indeed adds something to our understanding of the Holocaust and can it tell us something about relations between Jews and Jewish and, 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 and non-Jews and also about help and, and uh, rescue um, and I have some answers already and I'm, I'm looking at the time and I still have plenty of time but I will tell you some answers just to, to, to keep you here um, and, and I will, will, will tell, I will uh, give arguments for these answers uh, in, the, in the, the second part of the um, uh, presentation. First, I think it's very important, and that's, that's a very, maybe, uh, um, something that's not so surprisingly, but it's, I think it's important to realize that the story of Anne Frank is like all the stories of survival, it's an, an exceptional story. It's a unique story. What I find in the testimonies is mostly is that there, there's so much variety in stories. Uh, I, will, I will come back to that and explain this later, but that there's so much. This is, this, is a, this is not how it was for everyone. It was not common that people could stay, the whole family could stay together. It was not common that trusted friends helped you and that you could stay in the place that you knew. Okay, So that's one, and that's just a small thing. Um, the second is, I think, is that, uh, and, 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 and I will elaborate on that also, is that the pre-war identity and the community, so the way people, these Jewish survivors uh, defined themselves and defined their community, who they felt <coughs> close to, um, it did not really matter 
in, 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 in uh, whether someone uh, uh, for for the for the for for now let's say for surviving. Um, what I find, and, and I will I will also say more about that later. What I find is that these pre-war communities they uh, they, ex they they exceeded to exist. They, they stopped to exist at the moment that uh, the, ger the German uh, occupation started, and mostly the German isolation policy uh, and segregation policy started. So the the help did not come from uh, from within these communities. The, it came from the extended networks of rescue. So a little bit further away. I will I will tell you more about it, but just uh, wanted to to say this. And it didn't matter if you, uh, if you identified yourself or that, that if Jewish identity was a main thing in your life before the war or not, or whether you had many Jewish friends or non-Jewish friends or not. It did not matter anymore during the war. I, I see so many, I, I can't make, uh, I can't find uh, continuity in, 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 the, in, in, um, in, network, in, in communities and also in, in identity, it, it, it did not, there are Orthodox Jews and non-Orthodox Jews. There are Jews that had no uh, non-Jewish friends and there are Jews that had only non-Jewish friends that survived. So there's not much, there's a much more, uh, there's not a story to tell and I will come back to it later. And maybe this is the third um, conclusion that I already want to tell you is that this re the research of in the testimonies also makes clear to me that the myths of this tolerance, this myth of tolerance, is maybe not something that has to be rejected per se. I don't think so. I, I just think that we have to look again at the word and at what we understand as tolerance. Okay, how we define tolerance and what tolerance can also mean in different situations. So I don't think a rejection is necessary, but just we have to think about, rethink and how you call it in German, umdenken. So you, you have to, we have to think about it a little bit uh, uh, different. Okay, now I want to go to the testimonies because this is my work and I'm very, uh, uh, it's, it's a lot of work and I'm, I'm going to tell you that I'm very disappointed in myself because there are 2,000 uh, testimonies um, that um, mention the Netherlands or have something to do with the Netherlands, have something to do with Netherlands. And I have counted it, and I have recounted it, and again, and again, and again, and I am at 180. And I really, wow, that's I, a lot. I, I, I really worked hard, but it's just a lot of work. And uh, but it, it, it is, it's a very rewarding work. It's every time, and it was also when I was preparing this PowerPoint and seeing all the faces again. It was, it was like, like, like also my family a little bit. Very strange to say that, but uh, it, it, it felt really. Oh, I know you. I, I have heard so many. It was like seeing uh, each other back, so. But anyway, and in a way, all these testimonies, like I said before, are exceptional or are ex exceptions. We, there, it's very difficult to give uh, uh, one story of hiding or one story of pre-war <coughs> life, but I'm, I'm going to try to find some, some, some uh, to organize it and find some uh, common denominators. Okay, let's start with, um, uh, before the war. Okay, so if we, when I looked at and when I was organizing my, uh, uh, my notes again and, and looking at uh, the pre-war identity and the pre-war community, I discovered uh, uh, that, that, um, there, that, that there is so much variation. And um, there are f very varied um, different memories of how social life was and how someone, uh, and also how someone remembered, because it's all about memory, um, remembered whether or not she felt or he felt Jewish or was Jewish or had a Jewish life. Um, so there's one thing that the, the extent to someone, if, if someone was orthodox or ob observant, then quite often you find that that person um, defines her or himself more, more likely as, as Jewish, you know. And also, and that, that's the second thing, um, defines the community often as primarily Jewish. So I had just three examples, Betty Cohen, 
who is uh, to the right of you. She was born in 1921, and she mentions as her she mentions her uh, extended family as her social community, as her uh, emotional community, not her fr not her friends basically. Her family, her niece, that uh, her niece was her most important, her closest friend, and her family was uh, 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 was very important. That was her life. When she talks about uh, uh, her past, her pre-war years, then she talks about her family life all the time. You know, she had Jewish friends. Uh, she had non-Jewish friends at school, but she never took them home. And Betty Bouspulak in, in 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 the middle. She she was born in Amsterdam in 1919. She attended only Jewish schools, and she said that she had not one single Jewish non-Jewish friends. It was her family again, her family, that was her pre-war uh, community. And Frida, Frida Kramer, who was born in 1928, she was the Dutch. She was the daughter of a Dutch uh, rabbi of a Sephardic of the Sephardic uh, community in the Netherlands, in uh, The Hague. And her, in her interview, she told about the difference it made that she did not attend school on Saturday. Because she did not go on, s on Saturday, she, was always, she always felt an outsider. She didn't feel like the others that all went. I mean, school was still then, then on Saturday, and, and Jews didn't go on Saturday, or observant Jews didn't go on Saturday to school. And um, she also uh, stated that non-Jewish classmates were only friends to a certain point, not really. So you see that orthodoxy, or that it's being observant, quite often led to um, feeling, uh, a feeling that your, that your identity was primarily Jewish, and that your community was also primarily Jewish. It was the family, the extended family, and not much more. Um, there's another, how do you call it, variable, um, and, and that's the size of the hometown. What I find um, in all these inter 180 interviews is that the smaller the size of the hometown, the the, close, the the more Jewish someone feels, and the more Jewish the community um, is remembered. I mean, in, um, to the left, that's uh, Beth Lindemann. She lived in Koevoorde, six, six or seven thousand inhabitants, uh, seventy uh, Jewish families, and she she said that um, um, every. Um, uh, we stayed together always. Uh, everyone knew and helped each other. So it's a very close, it's a small community in a small town. And people are then more tended to see the, as their community, the Jewish community, and as their identity, the Jewish uh, identity. The other woman, she lived even in a much more smaller, in a village, really, in the north of Holland, in Lake. She was born in 1950. And she said, or she, she, she said in her interview, to be honest, as a Jewish girl in a small village, I always felt as an outsider. When a birthday was celebrated, I did go, but I felt like I did not really belong. I belonged to my family and my friends. So she means her Jewish friends. So for her too, living in a small city or a small town means that you are much more inclined to, 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 to or uh, that's what I find, is that survivors are much more inclined to remember as their uh, community, the Jewish community. Um, but there's also something interesting, I, and I would like to delve into this more, um, is that it's very important wha where you came from, how you remember the Dutch or your community and your identity in the Netherlands, and particularly your community. Um, there are many uh, testimonies of uh, German Jewish refugees that came in the 30s to the Netherlands. And I can say, almost without exception, they remember the Dutch as incredibly nice people, and their community was just an open community where they could join in, and Jewishness was not at all important uh, uh, for their identity, but also not for their community. They were just accepted. So this is uh, Bertel. She's from 1931. Um, and she said about uh, uh, the Dutch um, okay, about the way she was treated in the Netherlands. Oh, really like normal. Because in Holland, you don't have that feeling that they hated you, that you hated you and other Jews, like in Germany. Even before Hitler, you didn't have that in, in Holland. Because Jewish people were everywhere. There were 100,000 Jews in Amsterdam. There were tram conductor, everything. So the jealousy was not so much as in 
Germany, where the Jewish family had a little bit better life than, how should I say it, a German family. Anti-Semitism, no way in the Netherlands. So it's just very clear that in the Netherlands the community is, is a, the society is open and the community is, is not making any um, mm -hmm. distinction between Jews and non-Jews. Um, age is also important, yeah, how people remember their pre-war uh, life, how they remember the pre-war community and how they, uh, how they, how they describe themselves, how they, they um, um, how, what was their ident main identifier. And it's, it, 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 it's remarkable that the young people, the people that were like in the 10s or 20s uh, um, in, in, in the time that, uh, in the 30s, um, that they um, have, a, they, they are very aware that their parents might have uh, mostly or mainly Jewish uh, friends, but they themselves, uh, they, they hardly talk about, uh, they, 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 don't, they don't see it that way for themselves. Um, Bill Minko, for instance, he, it's there. He was born in 1922 in, in, in eastern um, Holland, eastern part of Holland. And he said he played with everyone in the class, although his parents had almost only Jewish friends. And Erika Moon, that's the woman uh, uh, below, she was born in a small village in the middle of, of the Netherlands in 1924. She said that she had always been conscious of being Jewish, but there was no religion. I was Jewish, and that was all. Everybody was very nice. Everything was very mixed. And Audrey Marvin was on top, and she was born at Clara Onderwijzer in Amsterdam in 1921. She stated that we're, we, were we were Dutch and we were Jewish. We never thought of who was Jewish or not. We never thought of it. It didn't matter. They were all friends of ours. So the, the youngsters, and they remember, well, when, when the youngsters at that time, they remember the community as a very mixed, a very integrated uh, community, an uh, unproblematic uh, community. <coughs> and I find it striking that quite a lot of these youngsters, they were even not aware of their uh, Jewishness. They, they, didn't, they, they didn't know. They, they, um, so there's four examples, but there are many more. Arthur Treibitz, is this man, um, he's born in 26 in Rotterdam. He had no idea what it meant Jewish until a classmate said that his mother was a Jew and he came home and he asked his mother, what does it mean and am I Jew? And then his mother said yes. Um, George Casuto, who was there, he, he realized that he must be Jewish when his father was arrested in 1941. Before that, he had no idea. He was born in 29, so he was already uh, in his, uh, well, let's say, 11, 12. So, but he, he had no idea of his, he, he had no, he, he identified himself not at all as Jewish. So it only happened when his father was arrested. And Els Knop, she, 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 she um, memorizes a strange, or fun, uh, funny, or a strange um, incident. It was in 1942 that uh, a classmate of hers, um, I forgot her name, Liesje Polak, came to her and said, oh, I'm so sorry for you because you are going to, uh, you, you have to go away from your hometown. You have to move to Amsterdam next week because you're Jewish. And then she became angry. She said, no, I'm not Jewish. Maybe you are Jewish. And then the girl became also angry, Liesje Polak. I said, no, I'm not Jewish. So both children, they didn't know, they were not aware of their own Jewish identity. It just came out in this argument that, they, that their mother came in between. And then she said, you are both Jewish. And Elsa Rodriguez, who is on the top, she, she remembers uh, that uh, her teacher told her at a certain moment, you're an Israelite. And she was just like, I don't know what it means. So she asked her father, she came home and she asked her father. And the father came completely upset and went, to, went up to the teacher and, to, and told him, well, please don't say that to my daughter. This is, this is none of your business and this is not relevant for teaching. So, you know, the, the, so this, this Jewish identity was not always there. Uh, and that's, 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 that's at least what we can say. You know, that it, it, it was the... the um, it was not conscious, not for everyone. It was just not everyone felt like, or knew even, that he or she was Jewish. It was the identity was not, uh, for, for many people, uh, uh, Jewish. And the community was, for most people, uh, a mixed community. I mean, there are exceptions, and there's variety. But this is basically what I, what I think um, is true. Um, 
most people I'm of the 180 interviewed um, did not could not remember uh, anti-Semitism in the Netherlands before the war. They could not think of an episode or an incident. Um, and then there's also something difficult with anti-Semitism because it's one of the main questions, it's one of the questions that is, is asked by the interviewer. It's a standard question, so do you know, can you remember uh, incidents of anti-Semitism before the war? Now, anti-Semitism is a very broad label and what someone perceives as anti-Semitism can, can be perceived by another one not as anti-Semitism, you know, or I, I want to give you a few examples. So Martin, Martin Rodriguez Pereira, he had been years and years bullied by his teacher at school and the bullying was as follows. He didn't go to school at Saturday, so his teacher demanded of him every Tuesday to stand in front of the class and uh, well sh show that he, he studied the work that he, he missed on Saturday. And Martin says after the war, so in his interview, he says, <laughs> well, this was not only a very painful ritual, like a torture, but it's also pure anti-Semitism. Okay, this is how he translates what happens to him. Now, Freddie Marx, who is here, she had to, she was born in 1919 in Amsterdam. She had to pass daily by a Catholic school on her way to and from her own school. Okay. And there were girls standing out. One day there were girls <coughs> standing out in front of the school and they, they, they yelled at her, you're a foul Yodin. So that means a, a dirty Jewess. And, but then the way she interpreted, the way she describes it in her interview is like, no, but this is not anti-Semitism. This were, th these, were these were bullying girls that had nothing to do with anti-Semitism. Okay, and Frederica, we've seen her before, Frederica Elburg, she said she remembers that she was singing songs with non-Jewish girls that were really uh, about yitz and, 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 and dirty Jews and blah, 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 blah. And she was singing it. It was forbidden by the, the teachers at school, but she was singing it anyway. And again, she doesn't see that as anti-Semitism. She just sees it, yeah, we were just children, we were just singing and we were just saying things. You know, so this, 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 this looking at anti-Semitism is very diffic is difficult. It's a, it's a kind of a risky um, business. Okay, these are just my few observations. I have many, many more, but these are just the ones that I want, want to share with you about the pre-war, uh, um, the pre-war um, feeling of belonging and being among Jewish survivors. And I think, the f so I, I want to just recap a little bit what I just said. I think in first place, what, 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 what is striking me, if you look at the testimony, is that there's such a wide variety that it's just, there's not one story to tell about uh, the pre-war years. There are, uh, some interviewers have a strong sense of being Jewish, others have not. Some had a strong sense of being Jew Jewish and therefore not belonging, others had not. Some interviewers were even not aware of the Jewishness. Okay, there's just a lot. There's a lot of uh, uh, um, um, variety of differentiation. Um, but what we can say, I think, is that for most, at least for the, 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 the interviews that I've seen, most of them, most of the interviewees, they um, they didn't see their Jewishness as their main identifier. I mean, some knew, but it was uh, there. There are exceptions again. But most, the most uh, of the interviewees, they, they don't, they don't see that Jew Jewishness as the main identifier before the war. And by far, the majority of the interviewers remember friendly and good relationships with uh, non-Jewish neighbors, friends, classmates. And in their memory, anti-Semitism is quite, although it's a very tricky uh, um, label, it is, uh, it is, it is, uh, it's almost absent. So in a way, these, uh, uh, these testimonies or the, the parts of the testimonies about the pre-war feelings of belonging and being, they, they support the idea, the myth of tolerance. There was indeed in the Netherlands, most Jews, they, 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 they did see the Netherlands, the pre-war society as a Jewish friendly society, a Jew friendly society. And they saw their community as a mixed community and their identity 
was a very complex identity and, and Jewishness was only one part of that complex identity. Okay, this is of course, uh, uh, probably you, you all know this, but, but this is of course <coughs> how people remember, how we remember the pre-war years because afterwards something terrible happened and it might that, that this is just all, the, now it was all good and then it all turned bad. Well, let's look at how it turned uh, during the war. Um, okay, I have just again a few observations and I will try to recap it at the end and I'm just going to tell you first the uh, observations. So what was um, what was striking um, me uh, listening to the testimonies about so the war starts and then the uh, Jewish persecution, the, the, the anti-Jewish measures start and almost all uh, uh, testimony uh, interviewees they remember one decisive moment when things changed and for youngsters it's almost always um, having to leave school that's really uh, that's really uh, the, uh, the the big traumatic the the, the, the the moment of separation. But it's it's uh, Elise van der Sluis, for instance. She is here. She said that that day that I had to leave school was a disaster. And Teresa Rodrigo Pereira, who is there, she said the sadness at that day when I had to leave school. But it's very. They are just two, girl, two girls of, of, of more youngsters that have almost the same expressions for that day. And, but quite often uh, they describe, like they, these two uh, interviewers, they describe that day as a day of shared sadness. So sadness that was also at an, with uh, the non-Jewish classmates. Mm -hmm. This was the, basically the last moment, this was the moment that they said goodbye to their community. Uh, non this was and it was still shared. It was um, still also the non-Jewish girls and non-Jewish boys at school. They, they 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 find it terrible that they had to leave. For others, the the the, the more the, the, the older generation, the introduction of the star is quite a is, is, is often the decisive moment, and and this moment too is often remembered as a moment of deep sadness, but also deep sadness that was shared with non-Jewish uh, Dutch people. Okay, Helena van der Steur, uh, she's there. She remembers how total strangers took off her head, took off their head for her and bowed at the first day that she wore uh, the star in public. Louise Sorensen, who is there, the, she had a similar, and, and there are quite, a, I don't know how many, but there's quite a few people, uh, Jew, Jewish survivors, that remember the day that they wore the star and that the reaction of the Dutch public was one of sympathy, of empathy, and of, of respect, of express respect. Um, but then, after that moment, the, and, and after the, 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 yeah, the mentioning of that moment, things really start to change in the testimonies. Because what you see then um, um, is that the community uh, uh, starts to fall apart. From that moment on, you really, I think that the, the, the decisive moment, and from that moment onwards, you, you, you read in the interviews or you, you, you hear in the interviews that the people that were their friends and the people that, 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 that formed their uh, community, they, they, they more and more uh, are out of the picture. Um, this, is, this was, in a way, this was the result of the uh, policy of the Germans, of course, because the Germans. In the Netherlands, they, they con there was never a ghetto, but it was a concentration of Jews, particularly in Amsterdam and in a certain neighborhood in, in Amsterdam. So people uh, coming from abroad, from outside Amsterdam, they had to move to, Jewish people had to move to Amsterdam, and Jewish people inside Amsterdam had to move to a certain areas. So they lost contact with their, they, they were not allowed to work, they didn't go to school, so the whole social infrastructure, the whole community, it just evaporated in a way. So we don't see, we don't see trusted friends helping. We don't see trusted friends anywhere, anymore. not always. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating now, but it, this was striking me. It's not the story of Anne Frank. We don't see them anymore in the picture. Quite often we don't see them in the picture. Um, and this is also a moment, a, a realization of that it's trusted friends 
are not there, it's also a moment of deep sadness and, uh, and disappointment. Um, let me see, it's the next picture. Um, so Elsa, who was there, um, she, she remembers uh, how she was picked up by a German truck. It was in 1943, I think, during a raid. And this truck made a stop in front of a house of a Jewish friend, a non-Jewish friend. And she saw this, this non-Jewish friend, and she waved, she said, hey, Hans, Hans. And, and, and she remembers that he walked away, he looked around, walked away and closed the door, and it was quite, and she, 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 she describes her disappointment, and that, that she, she said, she still remembers that uh, years after, so this was really, this was the moment that I was alone. And Martin uh, Rodriguez, who was here, he describes the moment that he had to leave Hilversum, which is a small town outside of Amsterdam, and had to move to Amsterdam. And he was walking with his family um, at the street. And he remembers that uh, uh, nobody knew me anymore. Nobody said, can I give you a hand? He was deeply disappointed by uh, the, the, the reaction of his uh, fellow citizens, non-Jewish fellow citizens. So quite often, what, 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 so the, the, the trusted friends in the story of Anne Frank, you don't see that quite often in the stories of the, the interviewees. Um, not as often as I expected it. And in most of the cases, it's really the extended networks of help. So a friend of a friend, of a colleague of a colleague. And Elsa, do, the, Elsa do, the, oh, I wrote the no, name wrong. She's Olivera. Anyway, the, the woman left uh, on the top. She, uh, she, found a, she found a teacher, and she just noticed that this teacher was doing, so she was at the new school, and she, she was noticing that this teacher was, was hiding something. And then she, she found out that this teacher was in, in a resistance movement, and, and so she just approached her. And, and, and that, that's the way she was saved. Um, um, Helena Rubens, that's, uh, this woman, she, she had a, a nephew of a non-Jewish colleague at, at the place where she used to work, and that nephew helped her. You know, but quite often, it was this, 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 this extended networks, this extended networks of help. It was not the trusted friends. And what is also very um, striking to me, I mean, I have this picture of Anne Frank in my head. I have to admit, I had this picture. And what was really striking is that finding a hiding place was really not as, not as, not that easy, but also not that. Um, well organized. It was quite often trial and error. Just ask someone and just see how people react. And also walking on streets evenings and then hiding and then going to first to extended family and via via. So it was not always this path that was well already thought through and, and it's kind of messy. And it's also a story of, uh, I think, of, 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 of dynamics. I mean, the story of Anne Frank that stayed for uh, two years at the same place is really exceptional. There are so many stories of, of, of young you know, of young girls and young boys that are even and old boys and old old, old men and old old women um, moving places all the time. They never never stay anywhere longer than than a month or something. Um. <coughs> Let me carry on. So basically, trusted friends, they were hardly in the, in the, the stories, but more there were extended networks and quite often complete strangers. So what we see in, in, in many of these uh, stories of uh, hiding, because we're now talking mostly about hiding, there's also, of course, a story of people going to camps and coming back and deportations, but this is, this is mainly, the survivor stories are mainly stories of, of hiding. And, um, um, is, 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 uh, um, sorry, I lost my track a little bit. Okay, yes, it's, 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 it's a different story, basically, than the story of Anne Frank. Not only that they're not a trusted friend, but there's also the families are not, and, and not only not trusted friends, and not only not known places, but also quite often, uh, uh, um, torn up families. So, so there's hardly, I mean, there's hardly any story, any uh, interview, uh, that's, that's exaggerated, but the majority of the interviews, they tell a story of uh, children being put somewhere else as parents, and even parents being 
torn apart. So it's hardly a story of staying together as a family. It's always a new story, and it's a, a story of, um, uh, yeah, of, of being on your own. So you don't have your community, or even the, 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 the small, the nucleus of, the com of your, your emotional community, which is the family, perhaps. It's not there, quite often not there anymore. Um, so I have a few of these uh, stories to tell, I guess. Um, Tiki Swellheim, who is there on the top, she was uh, born in 1940. She was very young. And she spent four years with different uh, uh, foster parents. She didn't remember her mother. Her mother didn't remember her when she came to pick her up after the war. Helene Petter, um, it's the woman in the middle. She was altogether more than, than five or six addresses, alone, also alone. And Heidi Markowitz, who is on top, uh, she was just 11 and was brought to even more places. I think she said something like 17 places where she hid. So, also the so that's one thing. So the, the, this idea of being together with uh, staying together with a family, your family. Uh, the, no, the whole community had gone to to its bone. It was it was it was gone. You were alone with often with strangers. And what you also see in these stories is that this relative autonomy that uh, Otto Frank and his family had in hiding is almost ex uh, uh, not existent in, in most stories. I mean, most stories are really stories about terrible dependency on, on, on the caregivers, you know, and people could be really mean in that case. So uh, you were dependent and that sort the situation, the, the relations completely changed. You had a kind of a new community, there was the community of caregivers and uh, uh, people in hiding, but it was a completely different relationship. It was not a relationship based on equality, it was a relationship on dependency. And people could turn it into, I mean, there are many stories of generosity and altruism, but there are also many stories of really sadism <coughs> and, 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 and really <coughs> um, mean stories. So Ella Weinberg, for instance, um, she's there. She told about how she and her parents when there was danger, they had to be locked in, a, in, a, in an under the ground in a very small yeah, kind of coffin kind of thing. And that the caregiver, she thinks, uh, on purpose, just let, her, let them stay, you know, let them stay much longer than was necessary. Um, Louise Sorensen, um, she, we've seen her before too. She also tells that her, her, her caregivers, they, they, didn't, they didn't let her share in the nice food. She could have bread and potatoes, but the, the nice food in the sense of uh, vegetables and, and, and fish or meat were, were just not for her. You know, and what, it was also, what also struck me is that these trusted friends or even selfish, selfless helpers, um, that there quite often there were stories and quite often the, the interviewers remember other motives. Quite often it was money, uh, it was money of the caregivers uh, th th they wanted money, but also quite often free labor. So it was easy for a young girl to find a home in a family where there were uh, young children, for instance, and, and uh, someone wanted to uh, just to keep, keep, keep someone who was a babysitter or uh, a cleaner. Young women could easily f com relatively easily find an address because they, uh, they could clean, they were cleaners. Young boys or young men could find work at, 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 uh, at farmers because they could help with uh, the harvest, for instance. Um, that Gaia uh, Tiroche in, in the middle, she was 25 at that time, at the time that she started hiding, and it was really one of the conditions that she could stay with this family if she would accept to, to just clean the house all the time. And Betty Bausch uh, Pollock, um, she's in the middle, she remembers clearly that she and her husband paid uh, quite a, an amount to the farmer that they stayed, uh, who gave them shelter. But at the same time, they had to work for him. They had to work uh, with the cows, and they had to work with the stables, etc. And he liked it, according to her uh, post-war testimony, he liked it, uh, their cheap labor so much that he forgot to tell them when their contact person showed up to bring them to Switzerland. So, th th so there's much more. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's much more to tell about the story. I will come back to it later. But there's much more to tell about the story. It's much more complicated and complex and messy. Um, 
Just one thing, last thing on the hiding, and then we turn to the, the post-war uh, periods shortly, and then I will round up. Um, there's one thing on, 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 on hiding, which is I think should, should deserve really more attention, I w and I, w I hope I have the time for that. But um, what, what, also found, what I also find in, in many stories of the interviewees, so it were not the trusted friends, but quite often the initiative for hiding really starts with Jewish initiative and, and, and um, with, 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 with inven inventive and uh, creative thinking and, and starting yourself to think about ways to, to, to save your life and that of your family. And quite often that, that went pretty far, for instance, in the, the story of uh, Zev Bar, his father uh, rented a place already in 41, he rented a place, a little summer cot a cottage uh, in, in the east of Holland, in, near the forest, with the idea in his head that we are going to hide there if, if, problem, if there are problems, we are going there and nobody will find us and nobody did find them. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the story of uh, Harry Emanuel, his father was well to do and he bought, uh, he bought a house in a small village outside of Amsterdam. And they just moved in there. They moved into there in, in 1942, and they stayed there. And there are more of these stories of, 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 of Jewish initiative, Jewish agency, to tell uh, uh, about the, the time in hiding. So now let's just recap this, 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 this period of the war years and, and identity and, and, and community and feelings of belonging and being during these war years. What I see or what I observed is, 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 is an entirely, uh, an, an, oh no, a complete breakdown or break up of communities, of pre-war communities, and also a lack of help uh, from friends, from people they knew, the trusted friends. It's also a breaking up of families, you know, it's, there's not this uh, families that stay, there, there are stories, but the most is, are not families that stay together, so the communities, they really to the bone broke down, there was nothing left. And instead, in the, in, in, instead of these communities came different communities and different relations with non-Jews, but they were very different indeed. They were not based on equality, they were, not based, uh, they were based on, on, on dependency. And these are very different uh, uh, relations um, and quite often also colored by different motives than, uh, than help or uh, selfless help, let's put it that way. Um, I will come back to that later because I have to say something more about it, but I keep it now because I want to carry on with the story. Um, after the war, I think that the testimonies are sometimes, I, I can see that interviewees get tired after uh, two hours of talking and, and the, 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 the after war time is, is mostly, yeah, I went here and there and that was it. You know, it, it's just done and, and people don't want to talk about it too much. They are tired and they are, they are just, they are just done also. Um, but just remember the figures that in the end only 14,000 of 140,000 Jews stayed in the Netherlands, or were still in the Netherlands in 1950. The 35,000 were there in 1945, no, 1944, and in 1950 it was 14,000. And also in the interviews, most of the interviewees, I don't know if that was also a um, a policy of the, the foundation, but I think most of the interviews were not in the Netherlands. They didn't take place in the Netherlands. Most were in, in, in uh, here in, in uh, the States, Australia, and um, um, other places outside the Netherlands. And most of the, the, the interviewers, uh, um, they, they did leave the Netherlands. Um, let's see what they have to say. I have three. Vera Blom, for instance, um, she said that the first year after the war, I just wanted to dance on the streets. I could go back to school, everything was just great. But then I began to realize what had happened. All those people that I brought to the train and did not return. A man who was selling uh, rags came to the door and he said that his business had really picked up well now the Jews had gone. So it's a story of anti a post-war anti-Semitism mixed with this sadness of people that were gone, but also a kind of bitterness about what had happened, basically. Betje Vonberg, she remembers how she came back to her parental home that was entirely emptied. I was 20 and felt like an old woman. 
My brother had been killed in Auschwitz. Twenty members of the family from my father's side had perished. The first Pesach at my house was terrible. Parents without children, children without parents. And Theresia Rodriguez, she said everything was uh, empty. I was empty, it was empty. And it was very difficult to adjust to normal life. I don't think it ever became normal again. There were too many scars and it was too lonely. So most of the survivors that, uh, uh, that I uh, listened to, who I listened to, they, 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 they left indeed the Netherlands. They could not, the scars were too, uh, too big. It was not only that large parts of the family was gone, it was also that their community uh, before the war was gone. They had been four years, they had been out of this community, they had not been to go, going to school. Quite often the going back to the places where they used to live was very difficult. I mean, houses were confiscated, jobs were gone. Um, so the, the, the post-war situation was difficult. The pre-war communities did not um, resurrect. But also, the exp I think, the experience in these hiding years is for many people has been very uh, traumatic or maybe even sobering up or disappointing and, and people were disillusioned about the, the bonds between uh, Dutch people and, and uh, Dutch non-Jewish people and Jewish people. I think that this should get more attention. Okay, um, some concluding remarks. Okay. Um, let's return to my list of Question. Well, not yet. <laughs> this is funny. Oh, we are in the dark. <laughs> We're basically in the dark. <laughs> yeah, I might want to like. This is interesting. Well, I just have to. Well, it's probably generating. Yeah. Also, the air condition is down. Oh, I see. Not so much yet. Because it went on after I left here. I'm glad. Yeah, it's only two. Someone doesn't want me to finish, I think. I think that's it, basically. I can carry on forever, but uh, it's already, I'm over time now. Yeah. Um, can I have a light? So, yeah, okay, then I, I, will, I will just <laughs> click quickly just carry on as if nothing happened. Yeah. Dutch are very good at that. Um, concluding remarks, I will say. Um, so I will just return to my list of questions that I asked earlier. So how did you see themselves before the war? And what did they perceive as their, who did they perceive as their peers, members of the pre-war community? And what I said is that the testimony showed a wide variety. Now, there was not like one identity for everyone. There was not one feeling about community for everyone. It was very um, variable. Nonetheless, I think that this myth of tolerance, in a way, uh, was still there. This tolerance was still there before the war. I mean, stories of um, testimonies about anti-Semitism are quite rare. Um, it's equally important, um, and, and that's just something that I can conclude from my research, is that um, one could question the importance of having good relations with the non-Jewish world for survival. I mean, these relations seldom materialized into rescue networks. That was quite often more the extended uh, networks that I talked about. So how did the Holocaust affect those feelings of being and belonging. And I think in the first place, profoundly. Physical isolation also meant cutting the ties between Jews and others in their community. For Jewish survivors, quite dis this was quite often a disappointment. And I would say this is perhaps not really a challenge of the myth of tolerance. But the other side of the coin, Toler tolerance is a strange thing and it can easily turn into something like indifference, into taking care of your own business and not caring about your neighbors. So I think there was maybe a tolerance. I mean, it, it is tolerance, but you tolerate that things happen to your neighbors. That's also tolerance in a way. So I think we should just look at that word maybe different, this notion of tolerance. 
And during the war, uh, I mean, in hiding, hey, hiding was, was characterized by, uh, I mean, this was really a very, it was a, it was a clean, a clean cut with what happened before the war. And the relation to communities and the relations uh, people had were complete new relations, often to strangers. And like I said, it, 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 it was quite often these relations were not based on equality or it was equal, equal players. It was really about dependency. And there are stories of philanthropic and, and uh, philanthropy and, and friendship and solidarity, but there are also stories of hardships and sadism and economic gain. So I guess this is, this is maybe tolerating also. This is also tolerating Jews, but really uh, on the condition, on the conditions. And this is not a uh, complete and total tolerance, I would say. Um, now my larger questions, and I will be very brief because I'm really over there now. Um, so my larger question was first, how can testimonies or research in testimonies and microscale research and to the relations or into the relations of individuals, how can it add to our understanding of the Holocaust? I think that first this testimonies research, what it shows me is that it brought back into my, in my eyes, it, br it brings back uh, Jewish agency in the story. So we hear, we hear a Jewish voice, we hear the Jewish interpretation of, uh, of, of history and uh, um, of things that were happening. I think that's very important what research in testimonies can do. And the second place, it gives a much more pixelated and dynamic uh, uh, image, both of pre-war and post-war times. Relations can change and they can vary. Mm -hmm. The second larger question that I had was the question, what can it tell us about Jewish and non-Jewish reactions to the Holocaust and issues of self-help and rescue? I think, well, first what I said before is that Anne Frank's story is just one story, one exceptional story, and there are many exceptional stories here, basically. And also that the story of finding hiding a uh, place of, or surviving, really, is a much more complicated and messy story than we sometimes would like to think. The motives of caregivers can also vary and change. Um, what does it mean altogether now for our understanding of the Dutch paradox, or for that matter, the myth of the Dutch tolerance? I think that during the, the war years, this tolerance quite often turned into conditional tolerance by the caregivers, or uh, indifference by uh, uh, the trusted friends, the old friends, the old members of the pre-war community. And I would like, and that's my final concluding remark, and I would like to think that this only happened, so this transformation of tolerance into something slightly different, this only happened because of external pressure, because of the presence of a German oppressor that narrowed down the circles of identification within the Dutch society. Thank you very much. <laughs> but it's all tentative. <laughs> <laughs> there are many explanations, but I can give you a few. First, this flat country. We have no place to hide. We, are, we have this green country. We have no hills. And where can you go to um, in the Netherlands? You cannot go. You can go to the North Sea, but there are uh, submarines, German submarines. It's not, you can go to Germany, but I would not say you would go. So there's only Belgium left that you could. Uh, so there, it's, it's a very, it, geographically, it's not such a good place to be if you're a person to I think. We have no woods, we have no really no mountains, we don't have these things in the Netherlands. Can I yeah. challenge this a little bit? <coughs> yeah. Because if you compare the numbers of people uh, who survived in hiding, actually you have a similar number uh, who survived in the, in the Netherlands, uh, but a bigger relational number regarding the actual number of uh, the Jewish population when you compare to Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Then so then I, yeah. So in, in, when you compare, yeah. actually this is a much better story yeah. than, for example, in Germany. In Germany, you had more places to hide. If you yeah. think about flat country, yeah. so 
Yeah, yeah but I think yeah, Germany is a different country. It's really from 1933 going on, so, so in, in the Netherlands it was a much, yeah, it was... No, but if you think about the war years, the yeah. total number of people who survived in hiding, I think, is 12,000 for Germany. Yeah. And we had, uh, at the war, beginning of the war, more Jews uh, in, still in Germany than in the Netherlands. Yeah. So okay, I I, I I can't say more about it. I, I yeah, but, um, okay, I, but I didn't want to. Yeah, but it, because so. there are more. I think uh, I will I will remember that. Um, um, but there was also what people, what scholars quite often say is that um, uh, the German administration in the Netherlands was very well organized and was very much. Um, uh, it it was a part. It the Nazi Party was very much repre represented in that. Uh, in the so the anti-Semitism was quite strong amongst German Nazis uh, in the Netherlands, and, and, and uh, if you compare that, for instance, to Belgium, there was a military, there was a military uh, uh, authority, a German military authority, mm -hmm. and they they didn't care so much. Versus Yes, and they didn't care so much about the, the persecution of Jews. Basically, they just wanted to trust in order to to, to have the strategical. Um, uh, plans uh, being executed. Um, there's also this this thing that in the Netherlands, as quite often would say, is that there's um, the Dutch administration is very well organized and it's very uh, was was really famous in the, in the 30s for the way the registration uh, of, of Dutch civilians uh, w was organized. Um, so this this whole administration stays intact when the Germans come and the Germans can use it and and there's a quite a lot of collaboration within the Dutch administration, the top of the Dutch administration, uh, with the German. Um, maybe it's not anti-Semitism, but it's just the use of being the best boy in the class and, and just having a perfect uh, registration. Yes. And there's also, and then uh, uh, there's this, this, this discussion, there's a lot of discussion about it, but perhaps there's something also to this. The, the way, um, um, there was this, there is this very strong law obedience in the Netherlands, and I, I don't know if it's really true, but it's quite often people point at that, that law obedience amongst, for instance, policemen, but also among Dutch uh, citizens, that the, the, there was just not a tradition of fighting in occupants. We never had, that. we quite we had for ye uh, decades, uh, hundreds of years, we didn't have an occupant, so there was no, there was a lot of law obedience in the Netherlands. Also amongst Jews, for instance, the registration of Jews, well, well, it, was, it was not voluntary at all. But most Jews, they uh, complied to that rule and they went to, to have themselves registered. They didn't know, of course, what it would lead to at that moment. But there is this, so there are many things that you could, and, and people point that uh, to explain this higher percentage. Um, and I think a combination of all these things together. In, in, in light of what you said, the variation, I think there's one, one, one thing that you didn't mention is uh, of, uh, uh, the seizure of, uh, of Jewish property yeah. by, uh, uh, by the, you know, it's an opportunity, economic opportunity yeah. to, to do that. And I, I, I wondered if it, I think it varied a lot too in the part of the Netherlands. Is I think one thing you uh, you know, but you didn't mention yeah. in the thing, is that the Netherlands is flat, but very compact and very regionally different, like what's yeah. in the north. And in, 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 I lived in, in the south of the Netherlands, in, in Maastricht, for, for, for uh, many years. And I lived in a little village uh, 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 that was the Maastricht is a Rhine culture where there was a very old Jewish community mm. from the from the Rhine living living there. We even had a Jewish, a very old Jewish cemetery that was mm. with old tombstones that had been totally forgotten. And, that, and living in this little village and, and being Jewish myself, but not that wasn't my theme. But uh, I thought well, it's fascinating. There's this Jewish community. That was here and rich and fair, but nobody speaks about it. Yeah. Nobody talks about it. And then when I probed in a little uh, uh, deeper, because I, I lived there for uh, 13, 14 years, uh, it was uh, this property issue. 
that a lot of the a lot of the 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 property that people now that were respectable could have been seized from the Jews that were that were betrayed or given up and uh, and led away. So I just I just want to add that yeah. one to the to the variety yeah. Yeah. of of, uh, of different motives of why it was uh, so so high uh, uh, yeah. a, a number. I don't know if that I I didn't do research into that specific topic myself, but. I don't know if that's different from what happened, for instance, in, in Belgium and France. I don't know no. if, I don't know if that yeah. is. Uh, you think it is, yeah. I, I, I think so, because, of, you know, the, there's always in, in, in that south of the Netherlands, there's a, almost a separateness yeah. movement. It's Catholic, and, and, they, and they, there's a tendency to move to Belgium, yeah. you know, to, to in, integrate. And in order to counteract that, the uh, uh, you know the the Dutch presence from from the Hague and from the, it intensifies its bureaucratic yeah. control over it. And the, I mean the University of Maastricht is one great example because at the time when it was going to, to there was a strong success uh, seceding movement, uh, the university was established as a cultural outpost. Mm -hmm. For the for the Netherlands, right in in the border, and uh, although they didn't put too much money into it uh, or other things, but they just had to have it uh, there. So I think that that I also noticed that you know the Dutch bureaucracy was even more Dutch yes. <laughs> than than you would find in Amsterdam, where you had this tolerance yeah. uh, aspect. So this kind of regional differences are, are, I think, can also can play into these uh, yeah. stories. Yeah. yeah, I don't know for sure. I know I, I did find not in this, um, not in this specific research with uh, the testimonies, but I, I do have uh, research of councils, city councils or village mm -hmm. councils that you know, now the Jews are gone, we take this house, we yep. take this property, and, 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 and so now it's finished. I mean, this is, this is in, in Hilversum, for instance, mm -hmm. a city near Amsterdam, and um, the cemetery is quite, it's still, it's a, the Jewish cemetery, it's in, in a very uh, interesting place for business people and for the, the government. So, so before 45 already, the, 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 the uh, discussions within the uh, community to, to okay now we, we are going to take this we're going to buy this which is we are going to play, we're going to place our own business there so that's what you do for me I mean uh, there are a lot of traces or a lot of evidence that, um, but I I'm not sure if that's really if that would be higher in the that this 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 desire to to see Dutch property is higher in the Netherlands than in other countries yeah. so I, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah. research question. Yeah. Yes, I see Sandra. Okay. <laughs> I, I have uh, this, uh, many questions, but one uh, interested me most was about identity, what is relevant in relation to pre war. Yeah. Um, from some interviews I, I, I listened to, um, maybe that's because they were related to. Germany specifically, um, people explained very much a difference between this way of population to see themselves as being both, uh, I don't know, German and Jewish mm -hmm. or um, Dutch and Jewish at the same time, yeah. and never consider um, uh, thinking into or uh, changing that very much, but as a form of population or in a, another Yeah. Um, I wonder if you see them that as well, or it was completely different, and if in certain ways Zionism also played, especially by young people, uh, mm -hmm. certain role. By young people, I see Jewish, Jewish identity is, is not defined. I mean, in general, Jewish identity is not defined. So, 
and, and, and identity is, is also a catch-all for this, basically. But um, anyway, it's not defined, and, and but it's, it's just we didn't go to shul, we didn't go to, we didn't, we were not observant, we were not having, so so um, youngsters today, and they are quite often aware that my parents, my father always went to shul, but I didn't, or my grandparents. So you do see also the the assimilation in, in generations. Uh, in the older generation, um, quite often, or at least I have a few of these testimonies uh, stating that um, that there's a difference or there's a distinction between citizenship and religion. So we're Dutch citizens from an, of a Jewish religion. That, that's basically uh, what, what, what a lot of uh, older people say. Yeah. But they didn't need it to confirm this um, this identity of being very national or, or loyal to the Dutch people? Um, uh, children, not. No, I, I know. I know what you mean. You mean that, that the German Jews were very, they were very anxious of being seen also as, as, as German. <coughs> um, what I perceived was yeah. a, a little change that even though the elderly, the parents were seeing this <coughs> yeah. uh, duality, yeah. the, the children, which were 15, 14, started to question that and say, no, we have to realize that we are Jewish. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, no. Of course. Um, amongst uh, Orthodox or observant Jewish children, we do see that, and, and Zionists. They also, but no, in the, the majority of the interviews uh, were not Zionists or were not observers. So, so no, I didn't see that. The, ch the children, no. no. So as a kind of a counter movement or something. <coughs> no. Uh, first of all, I wanted to add, which I forgot, uh, to do her justice. She is an associate professor uh, at the U Utrecht uh, University. I forgot. Yeah, just to situate you where you, uh, you are, since you talked about Maastricht and Amsterdam, so she is at Ulder, you to it. Uh, my question is a little bit coming from there, because when you say the, the testimonies, they don't say this. Yeah. So you mentioned in the beginning there are 2,000s, yeah. and you mastered actually more than 100, which I found incredible. However, this is a portion of the yeah. actual number, and you mentioned also that uh, most of the, the, the interviews you have seen are from people not in the Netherlands anymore. They are kind yeah. of emigrated. So my question is uh, again, threefold. So one is, first of all, how did you pick the interviews? Yeah. So how mm -hmm. these hundred? Yeah. Then I was struck by uh, the gender balance because I think yeah. 70, 80 percent were women. Yeah. So my question is. I just like it better to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, my question is. I does the, the, does the, um, the woman uh, tell a different story, I which is more interesting to you because you are interested in these relationships? Are they more detailed? Is they, uh, do they have a different hmm. narrative in this regard than yeah. male uh, um, uh, um, survivors? Um, and then uh, this is the, the third part is more when you think about the, the uh, the relationships, and you mentioned that uh, they break down and then they, they uh, get new relationships, but some relationships are tainted. Yeah. So for example, by money, and I found this maybe a little bit tainted also by the perspective of the survivor. Because when they look back, mm -hmm. they think about these things in sometimes very simplistic terms, because did they get harmed or not yeah, yeah, yeah. by the relationship? But if you think about the other side, the, the actual helper, um, there's more research now, for example, on Poland and, and so yeah. also on relationship in Germany. People needed resources to hire yeah, somebody. Yeah, yeah. And asking for money could mean they didn't have the resources, mm -hmm. so they needed to kind of do something about yeah. it. And money was not enrichment or greed, it was actually to help to yeah. sustain yeah. The, the effort. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, this was yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah, there, there's much more, of course, there is also much more variation and differentiation in how much do you ask. I mean, this this, this example of uh, of this woman, Ella Weinberg, who, in, and, and uh, I don't know if she's, no, that's not her, it's not a woman. 
Um, and, and, and she's working for this farmer, and the farmer doesn't tell her that her contact comes, who, who was supposed to bring her to, to Switzerland. And I think, ooh, that really goes far. But maybe he forgot. Maybe that is, for, you know, and, 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 and quite. And there are also testimonies to say, yeah, we, we paid a lot of money, but of course it was needed to, to, get, money, to get food. Um, there are also stories of we didn't have any, so parents that die and cannot pay the money anymore, and then the children have to leave because they, there's no, you know, if we don't, if we don't get money, we cannot take care of you. So that's, that's not nasty, maybe, per se. Um, so there is indeed, um, I think I did a little bit of debunking because I think that the story of the trusted friends and the selfless rescuer needs a little bit of counter, counter stories, maybe. Okay, the second thing with gender, I did notice that, of course, and I, I will look why I have, I think I have more, not only in my presentation, but I think I have more women um, and amongst the, the, the interviews that I, if that's true and it's not fair, <laughs> then I will include more male interviews. I think but in general- I didn't say this because, like, no. well, maybe the woman tell it a different story in a way which is more interesting to you because I you I think I about these yeah. relationships. I must, I must look in there. I, I didn't do that. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm not sure. I, I will look in. That is interesting. Um, there are, of course, more youngsters than that. that, 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 that. But I, 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 uh, I, I have to look into it. I don't know. So the selection, that's interesting. Because I started, as uh, you know, and you know at least, um, that I had this proposal of looking at four different cities in the Netherlands. So I wanted to look at four different places in the five different places, towns in the Netherlands, and then compare them uh, maybe to others in uh, abroad in Germany or elsewhere. But in particular, I had four different places. So that turned immediately, I mean, in the first week, I was always like, this is not going to work, because everyone moves, like four times, five times, six times. Nobody stays the same place. So what do I want to know um, about Amsterdam, to, to how the experience is of the community like in Amsterdam? It, people move all the time. So. I had to let go of that. So then I just started going through the uh, through, through the testimony, and I, I, I just started. That's basically what I did. And um, I don't have, um, I now I have an appointment with Christian, and I want to look at specifically at German refugees in them, so that I, I in this last weeks that I will focus a little bit more. But my selection is really very. Uh, random. It's just a selection of. of uh, I just started. I don't have. I will now that you mention it, and I, 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 I will look at sort of this German this group of German refugees, but also at age. So I want to look at do I have all groups a little bit uh, represented in, in, in what will be um, uh, state group? Uh, not just uh, a selection, basically. But I don't know. Uh, I have not selected, for instance, on people that moved abroad after the It just is, I mean, if, if you look at the numbers of 35,000, 14,000 stays, so most have moved. And I don't know if this what has been the policy of, of, of the interviewers, um, or to, to select more interviewers here, and then uh, that it was much more advertisement, okay, we start this show, our foundation project, and now we, we, we start this show. Maybe it is, I don't know. It's, but uh, there is now uh, an Anna Pauline guy, she did this uh, comparison with the Lithuanian Jews. So yeah. um, abroad and still in uh, Lithuania, and they have so different narratives. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if this may be also true yeah, for yeah. Uh, Dutch Jews mm -hmm. when they are abroad, that they look back, yes. it's more about the rupture yeah. than it would be when they, when yeah. they are still in living in this uh, yeah. community. Yeah, I can imagine. That was part of the question I was going to ask, and also, did you listen to different languages? Did, were the interviews? No, um, other, did you just do English or just Dutch? English? What did you? English and Dutch. The, the most interviews are in English and Dutch. Yeah. I listened to uh, one in French. That's basically. Yeah. But most, I mean, if you look, there's Hebrew, of course, but there's not Yiddish, but there's Hebrew, and but the interviews are not are not the. Um, they're not, they're not the most. The most are really in Dutch or English. And you stay with those two languages? Of 
Um, for now, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. And there, the, but really, the so if 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 there are two thousand, I have to count. But I think there may be hundreds of people, of two thousand, and there may be five in Spanish or in Portuguese. Portuguese, yeah. yeah. But it's really not many. Mm -hmm. They just get limited Portuguese, and they they are mainly from Portugal. Who ended up in in Kendo, um There's one in particular that I wonder if you listen to. Yeah. yeah, and 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 she or he lives now in, or lives in uh, Brazil. in Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have found, and but also after the war, people move around sometimes. I mean, they they go to Israel. They yeah. disappointed in Israel, or they want to go somewhere else. They go to Latin America quite a few, and then they they can, they got something happening in Latin America in the sixties, and people move and to move to back. Australia or to or move and back. Some also. even here to Los Angeles. Right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so. And via via Latin America. Yeah. Via South America. Yeah. Yeah, but I can imagine that, that there's a very different narrative of people moving out and uh, yes, and people that that became observant after the war and then they look back at the period. Yeah. And looking back also is interesting. Yes. Depending where they ended up. Yes. Yeah. And then they are so interested to look back as opposed to those just remaining. Yes. Yeah. That's a very interesting. That's not the way they describe. Th there's nothing left for most of the the interviewees. There's nothing left. There's they are they are left to their own devices and, and they, they, there's so this. Mm, it's a very interesting point, but I didn't find it in the interview. And maybe it's also because of the the way people are interviewed. I don't know. Maybe if it was explicitly asked, so did you feel did you feel still attached to your family, or what did you feel about your, you know, these questions <coughs> were asked. Yeah. But the story is really a story of uh, yeah everything gone and being brought back to an atom and, and being there uh, on your own or maybe with new people. And very different. Uh, yeah, relations and very different situations. That, that's basically it. But it's I find it very because that is basically what I would like to see as the emotional community. And then, yeah. but um, no. Thank you very much. It was very interesting, and it is, I think, the first time when I think about my own research because I know there's a lot of parallels. Even even uh, we have very different uh, regions, and uh, the so former Soviet Union is like uh, 
completely different story to the uh, Western country, but still. And uh, what I'm thinking about is uh, the generalization of your conclusions. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we are talking about the particular experience of a particular person and you are trying to put ours in the micro level perspective, do we have, um, uh, can we just generalize uh, all these things? I can give you one small example. For example, um, North Caucasus, my region, is a very, um, so to say, collaborated region to, uh, to Nazis. And uh, Cossacks uh, were involved in the extermination of Jews uh, uh, during the all the mm -hmm. time, yeah? And so this is the general view. But if we look to the uh, stories, personal stories, to the survivor stories, we can find that even Cossacks helped yeah. people to survive. Yeah. And so, so it is changing <coughs> the Holocaust history itself, or what, what can we do with these yeah. generalizations, you know? Yeah, well, I think that, that that's the basic question of microhistory, really. What is, I mean, what is microhistory different uh, than telling an personal anecdotes or, you know, how, what is the, the, sur the plus, surplus, additional value of, of microhistory? And, and um, I, I, I remember last, in, in 2016, we, we had this conference in, in uh, Washington, and we had this, this last um, Skype call with uh, Marion uh, Kaplan, and I asked her that question. So how do we go from the, the individual and the small story, how do we go to the, the macro scale? So what, can we generalize? How many cases do we have before we can generalize? How many? Um, <laughs> yeah, how, <laughs> so, so, and, and then she said, yeah, but you, have to, you just have to stop asking the question and just accept that every story is just has its own value on its own. You don't have to have a number. You just tell a story and, and, and you just have to and that gave me a lot of room, and I'm just accepting it now because I, I find her work very good. But you know that you, um, this is micro history. This is micro history, and micro history. You don't need a kind of legitimation for. This is just. This is. This is. This is. These are stories, and they have value. They have value on their own, and um, yeah, that's basically what, what I would would. And that, that that's what every time when, when I think of those reasons of. Every story is an exception to the general rule, and every story is exceptional, and every t story has its right of its own to be told. Does it mean that grand narratives are um, corrected or are, um, or that there is extra, you know, that it's added things to it? I, I don't know. If, if maybe, maybe the ambition should be a little bit lower. Just telling a story. Like everyone is reading, also people that tell the general story tell just the story. It's just a story. So my answer would be that we are working with the memory concepts for the post post war year. Yeah? Yeah. It's like uh, the survivors' testimonies, and we don't we can't find us people who became victims. Yeah. It's like the yeah, other but that's we, yeah. we could find, for yeah. example, with these anti-Semitic problems or with yeah. the persecution or with friends and of not friends. Yeah. So this is like the difference. Yeah. And if we are going to the micro uh, uh, micro level, so we are doing with memory uh, memory politics or memory uh, yeah. right. We are uh, reconstructing the story according to the memory. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah, but there is one more point. I mean, you just brought this example when the Cossack is helping. What does it tell us that there is much more? Uh, the, the reality is much more complicated, mm -hmm. and there are choices to make. And the Cossack made a choice. And uh, what I think, what you learn from beyond the personal story, is that relationships is all about choices, and the people yeah. had to make these choices. And uh, this was often kind of depending on the conditions and situations. But still, it is not like clear cut. There's just one way to, to no. get it. Yeah. And I think this is what, what you learned. It complicates uh, our view on these relationships yeah. and also the implications of the relationships. I yeah. mean, uh, if somebody makes a choice, like what you said, that the trusted friends go away, yeah. then uh, practically this has a, a large impact not just on the individual uh, story. Yeah, yeah. So yeah this is true. Yeah. And we learn a lot about choices when we look at this level of yes. relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing for that I want to to mention is um, in 
was very interesting that you put the, the concept of community because I'm, I always fight with the sense of community. We generalize so it's a ge community as we knew. <laughs> what is that? And mm. the moment we want to get into details, we can. It doesn't fit at all. Yes. <laughs> there is no uh, this abstract community doesn't exist as such. Uh, and in in if you go to the to the tiny level to to see the, the each well, everyday relation, yes. what we make or describe it, it's what we try to um, define as community is the moment when we uh, get tackles on what are the relationships, why people define themselves, uh, how they identify with this or with the other, and yeah. to which sense they, they build uh, commonality. Yeah. Um, that uh, was for me very interesting, and I think that to the discussion right now, it was that what brings exactly this um, deep um, into the very specific cases uh, when you analyze. analyze. Uh, I would be very interested in to see that if you could follow up some um, relations or family relations, because mm -hmm. some, many of your interviews mm -hmm. have the same last yes. name. Yes. And uh, I, I am planning. That's what my, that's my intention. Well, you know, that I have a few family. families that I will do. Yeah, because that's very interesting. Yeah. And to see the the Rodriguez Pereira, the mm -hmm. rabbi family. There's much written about him because he was a famous professor in uh, classic languages. So there's and, and there are a lot of stories also about. I I mean I interviewed even two of his former pupils, non-Jewish. Uh, so, so there are a lot of stories about him and about him in this village. He lived in Hilversum, and Hilversum is one of my villages that I'm looking at. I'm going to write a book about that. And, and this one, so that, and then, and then, then this this family will be one of the families that I follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, about in, in one thing more, and, 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 and because you, your point really made me think about. Uh, so, so people do think, of course, that it, this is temporary. That they are there, and it's just nasty and it's terrible. But it's temporary separation. They will come, go back to their families. They don't know how and when, but they will come back. And they th always think it's faster than it is, actually is. So that is that is, and I don't uh, also identities and communities. These are very fake and a bit a little bit fluffy concepts maybe. Um, but at the other and 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 I think it's also important to realize that, I mean, the way I describe it or the way I now use it as tools is, is kind of is, is still not good enough I think because it's quite there's one community there's one identity whilst at the same time I know for myself I have so many com I am a climber I have a climbing community I have a family as my family community I have my work community I have my Dutch community I, I have hundreds of communities that I feel loyal to or feel these are important to, to me and, and and I have not also an identity. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a woman, and I'm Dutch, and I'm, I'm here abroad. And, and I mean, I have also many ident identities. So, story gets complicated. And, <laughs> and if, if I take that, and I, but I should, because that, that's also. I mean, and, and then if you look at Jewish identity, even what does it mean being Jewish? Is it religious? Is it tradition? Is it cultural? What does it mean basically? So. Could I just mention something? Do you want to take a interview? I don't know if you had a chance to do some Jeff Finfield. No, not so. Right, and he belonged to the Portuguese synagogue. Yes, yes. Synagogue, is it still a Jeff Finfield? Yes, it's a Friday club. Well, that was a center for them. Yeah. So there is religion that's connected to that. Yeah. What happened afterwards and what gave him the strength afterwards? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Is it in Dutch or English? Or? It's in English because you ended up here. Oh, yeah. I think you gave it to me. You know, long, I didn't Did I? The link, long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So. I think we should uh, thank uh, Geraldine. Uh, thank you. Thank you.